Hello and welcome to the third of our series Coping with Covid. Today forensic psychologist Anne McKechnie is back but this time she is talking to HR consultant Stella Stern. They will be focusing on the impact of emerging from lockdown, of going back to work and the new anxieties that it brings. Stella will be sharing her current experience at work, touching on topics like how she can support her staff and the lack of motivation she is seeing. Anne will be reflecting on why this is happening and how we can improve staff morale. They will also be discussing the emerging divisions that are happening between individuals at work and at home why people are forgetting skills and losing confidence. I am looking forward to hearing why and I hope that you are too. Let's ask ourselves, how do we face the new normal while keeping our minds and those around us healthy? As we've moved into phase one and look toward potential further easing and restrictions, I'm noticing that this has not necessarily led to equal easing in our anxieties. In fact, I think it's in some cases made things worse. Is this something that you are seeing as well? Most definitely. And I think that's been a a worry that's been around for a lot of people right from the start is that, you know, there's there's been a sense that actually once we get out of our bubbles that actually it'll be great and we'll all be excited and there'll be parties and you know it'll be fantastic I'll be able to hug everybody but actually it's not it's not that straightforward because we're easing out there's a sense of a continued anxiety so it's almost like kind of coming out of our caves and we know that there's the, the wild beasts are still there but we've got to get back on with our lives so I think there's that anxiety I think for many people they might have coped in the bubble I've heard lots of people saying that actually it's quite, it's almost, they feel quite childlike, like they've got no responsibility and now they're going to have to take responsibility. So that feels really anxious. Yes, I would agree with that. Um, And I think in terms of um, how people are feeling at work as well, it's the realisation that what was put in place at the start of lockdown where everything just stopped and everybody was in the same boat together. Now, as we're coming out of it, the reality is that people, what they thought was going to be a short term measure is actually going to potentially be their way of working and their way of being for quite a long time to come. And I think that is something that has also heightened their anxiety because that's not what they were expecting. They were expecting this generally to be a short, sharp thing. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right, Stella. And I think businesses have had to really kind of think on their feet where this is concerned because you know there has been a notion we'll just keep it quiet for a while even furloughing has got a notion that actually you'll just be out for a wee while and then we'll get you back in, it'll all be normal. But, you know, reading about all of these measures that are people having to take and even, you know, shoe shops talking about people trying on shoes and then the the shoes being put away in storage for 24 hours, Um, books being left for 72 hours before they can be used again. And that really leads to a lot of anxiety. And I think there's several types of anxiety. There's the health anxiety, which is what if I or one of my loved ones gets this disease? What happens? So being anxious around people about touching um, things about, you know, if you're not using a face mask, if you are using a face mask, you're anxious. Um, the, the, the use of hand sanitizers, all of those things is that health anxiety, which makes people really, really nervous about leaving their, their, their home and moving into a different phase. Some people are anxious even about doing what they can do. I've heard about people who have simply not been shopping at all. So they've been getting deliveries or somebody else has been doing it for them. Not necessarily because they're shielded, but because they're actually just too anxious to go out there. So that's the sort of health anxiety. Um, the other thing I think is, is this sort of social anxiety that we have. You know, we've been socialising in very, very small groups and very select groups for a long time. You know, my main contact has been with my husband. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that sense of being able to speak to other people, you can do it maybe on these Zoom chats or quizzes, but it's not the same at all. So there's the kind of, what am I going to talk about? You know, what's, what I'm going to say, because I'm going to talk about except COVID or, yes. you know, what I've had for my tea. It's, it's Is that you hearing that as well, Stella? 
Yes, absolutely. And I think um, there's also a real loss of confidence, just as you say, in how to interact with people. But even in a work setting, gosh, can I remember to do this? I'm not sure what to do anymore. And yes, I'm fine to do it behind the mask of an email. But if I have to be face to face personally with someone again, am I going to be able to do that as well as I did before? So I think there's a real concern about confidence, but I'm also hearing a concern around de-skilling as well, because I'm aware of people who, for reasons of social distancing, but for other reasons as well, just can't work at the moment. They don't have the tools to do their jobs. So, um, and while they're not doing that for a long, long period of time, you know, how, how when they do eventually come back into the workplace, are they going to be de-skilled in comparison to some of their colleagues? Absolutely. And I think I think that's a really, very real concern. And I don't think it's something that we can necessarily dismiss because, you know, three months, four months, whatever we've been in for this is, is quite a long time for, in, in some people's skills. And you're right, some people have been able to keep that up and in fact may have developed new skills because of this, you know, remote working. But for others, it's a real anxiety. And I think there's particularly an anxiety where you've relied on mixing that sort of skills and social skills. So people who've got face to face work with the public, that's going to be very difficult. Yeah. But I also am concerned that people who are managers, where you rely on good and well, you should rely on good interpersonal skills to be a good manager or leader. If you've lost them or forgotten them or they've changed slightly, while you've been in lockdown, then that's going to make you feel quite anxious. Um, and it might also make your staff feel actually, hold on a minute, this isn't the way things used to be. Yes, exactly. And I, and I think on that point as well, there's the issue, as you say, of good people managers and maybe managers that are in a position that they have, you know, employees reporting into them, but management's not really their thing. So I think for the different um, people, you know, depending on their manager, their whole experience of being in lockdown is quite dif dif different because if they have a good manager, that good manager is keeping them connected and, you know, keeping them updated. And um, so they are, as much as possible, helping them to still feel part of the team. But for others, they could be feeling totally neglected. And I think there's a real issue there around how do we reach out to these people because their anxiety levels are probably worse mm -hmm. because they're feeling ignored. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. One thing I've noticed over the past week or so, Anne, is that motivation levels among the team have really fallen off a cliff. Um, I think, again, I think it's back to the reality of their situation and the fact that they're going to be there for quite a long time and not just a short space of time as they thought. Is that something that, that you're noticing? And I'm just wondering, you know, how how do we manage that? How do we manage that lack of motivation? Mm -hmm. I, th I think there's a number of reasons for it. I think I get a sense from a lot of people that it's almost like we're in the doldrums. People have lost enthusiasm and drive and they're generally quite flat and quite I wouldn't say depressed because I think that's too big a word, but I think there's there's a sense that people are actually really just fed up with it. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you're and if you're fed up, your motivation goes as a result of that. So I think that's part of a factor. I think there's also um, that kind of immobilizing sense that we've been cosseted and almost it, it's, to me, it's probably not a very good analogy, but I think um, it's a bit like people coming out of prison. You know, there's some people who don't want to come out of prison because actually everything's been done for them. They've been told where to go, when to go, what to eat, where, where to eat. Everything's decided for them. And there's something quite childlike about that in that you actually don't take any responsibility. So some people are anxious about taking responsibility again for themselves. Um, and I think there's also an element to which they've actually, the, the, again, it comes back to that skills missing but also that anxiety about you know what's it going to look like and how do we build up how do we motivate people um and not just say to them you're just going to have to get back to work and that's just tough 
because, mm -hmm. uh, but it's balancing. I suppose one of the issues that I've always got when I work with organisations is how do you balance that compassionate um, mental health aware approach and the business need? Yeah. And I think sometimes people think you've got to do one or the other. And actually, if you go too far into the compassionate and mental health aware world, it becomes a bit too, a bit not focused enough. And if you could do too far into the business need, you actually don't get your best out of people. I think Is that, would that be your view? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think because of the severity of this crisis and the fact, you know, nothing like this has ever happened before, very much from a business perspective, it was, look, your health, physical and mental is the most important thing, which, I mean, obviously it is and obviously it continues to be. But as the threat level reduces, then, you know, the business needs, start, needs to kick back in but it's getting that message right for people that, yes, we, we obviously we still care very much about your health, but, um, yeah, the business needs to, to move forward now and how you get that message across without sounding cruel. Mm. And I, I think that comes down to possibly, and this is what really goes back to the sort of skills anxiety, it possibly comes back to, you know, good leaders and good managers being reminded of what makes them good leaders and good managers. Yeah. You know, so good leadership is about clarity. It's about transparency. It's about being open about what you don't know, but making a commitment to find out what you don't know and really that back. Um, it's about listening to your workforce, but also being being very clear about what you expect for, for them. And I think... Um, for, from, from what managers should be looking for is opportunities to be in dialogue with staff. So one of the things that I've suggested to one of the organisations I work with is say to them, look, ask your staff what they need to make them feel safe. Now, for some people, they've said, I can't possibly come back to work until this is um, all completely resolved, until we've got vaccines and I know that the world is entirely safe. Now, that, those aren't people that are shielding. That's not a group altogether. Yeah. Those are people just so anxious. And it's unrealistic for a manager to say, sure, we can do that. But it's also not very helpful to say, well, it's just tough because we're going to have to live with this for a couple of years. So you're just going to have to you know, swallow your anxiety and get in here. So what you would do in a in a in a sort of mental health anxiety level you would actually set some gradual steps so you would say and we're probably going to be allowed to do that because of the phased returns so saying to people to come in in, in a shift pattern so you know to have people sitting at distance to have systems set in and just to sort of say right okay if you're really anxious how about you come in for a couple of hours and you set that kind of agenda yeah. and say, right, we'll want you in two hours for, for, for the first you know week and then four hours for the second week and actually give people very clear instructions. Where people get anxious is where there's a lack of clarity. We want absolute black and white lines. So having things delineated, delineated mark, you know, lines marked down with, for two metre distance, having um, sterilising, you know, sprays and hand sanitizer and things, having people regularly, even if people are anxious about that themselves, even having your, you know, your, if, you're, if you're in an office environment, having a cleaning staff around more often to be able to help with that, having the cleaning, cleaning staff as well on board. This has got to be, everybody's got yeah. to be on board. So breaking it down to small manageable steps and explaining at every turn what you're doing and what you're not doing. Um, yeah. so it's communication think, it's key yeah. communication is key isn't it communication yeah. um and yeah. like you say clear communication so that they feel included in the decision making process as well yeah absolutely and one of the things that I know you and i have talked about as well is this concern that some people will have worked so long in their bubble that actually they've become they've reverted to type in that that um, you know, they've become, you know, I've become more of a psychologist than I was of a, as, a, as a multidisciplinary team work, um, staff member. Or, you know, somebody's become, if they're always, you know, slightly, um, I'm looking for my words here, if they're always slightly antagonistic in a team, when they're away on their own, they might become more antagonistic. So that, that team working that every single environment requires, 
where you have to learn how to moderate your your own um, abilities and your own um, personality characteristics and you have to learn how to work together that's potentially gone i've seen at the start of covid i don't know if you noticed as well Stella, i saw a lot of really very good detailed correspondence and emails because people couldn't clarify by just walking across a room yes so very carefully well written emails but people have kind of run out of patience with it yes um so it's almost like you have to introduce not some kind of team bonding, but just give an acknowledgement that actually you might find that you're more irritated, you know, by your 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 um, colleagues than you used to be, or um, you're less patient, or you don't understand why they don't get things. That's part of the easing back in yeah. to the workplace yeah. is accepting that that's normal. Yes, I agree, and I think it's also a case of getting the right level of communication because. I think people have taken on board that communication is important, but what that ends up sometimes looking like is that people have got a Zoom call with one team, they've got a Zoom call with another team, they've got an all staff call for the whole company and before you know it your day is taken up with people wanting to make sure that you are okay and tell you what's happening and that becomes overload so I think mm -hmm. it's about um, you know it's respecting those work-life boundaries as well um, yeah I think and, and I think that, that that tendency to go into overload will will be there even more so when people get back into the workforce because you know there's there's that you'll be on hyper alert going into work whether you're driving walking taking public transport whatever you'll be anxious going in you'll get therefore you, you know the, the energy that's required to be hyper vigilant is actually qu is quite depleting so you'll come in you'll be tired so i think people have also got to recognize that we can't expect to put people back into the workforce and get the same productivity as they had before it's not as if it will never come back but there has to be an acceptance that you know for the first you know two three weeks things will be pretty slow and we'll be easing people back into it the same way as you would if somebody had been off sick you had a return to work you know phased return to work yes, attitude yes 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 that's that that's a good point because I think there's also, I think we talked about this as well, and this, there can be a bit of a divide between the people who have remained as much as possible in the office because they could be classed as critical workers in their organisation and the people who somehow feel, well, we're second class because we are not classed as critical. We're the people that have been you know, told we must stay at home. Um, and I, so I think as that group start to filter back into the office, I think there's a potential for conflict there as well. And I wonder how best managers would deal with, with that situation. It may be that the manager themselves actually has been more out of the office than in the office. It just depends. But I think there is, there, there is a potential for conflict there and it would be interesting to know how that could be addressed too. I, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think there is a potential for huge amounts of conflict, and I, I think the only way to do is to actually have some kind of open acknowledgement of that, um, and that not to wait until it's an issue, because I think sometimes people think, "Oh, I better not name it. I won't. I won't. Ref I won't say." Actually, you might be feeling a bit. Those people who've been key workers might be feeling jealous of those people who've been working at home. Those people are working at home feeling they're missing out yeah. um, on being in the workforce, and actually to have that conversation very early on when you get people back in to say this might be, and it's, 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 you know, I've said before, my, one of my favourite questions and my favourite phrases is some people say that, because it's not saying this is what you're saying, it's saying, look, this is what I've heard and it gives permission. Yeah. So even for managers to be saying what some people might be feeling is that they've been a bit, um, they've been less favoured or they've felt they've been disadvantaged by either being at home or having to come into work. That's perfectly normal. What we have to do is to, to is to watch that, that those feelings are actually, you acknowledge them to yourself and then we work together to rebuilding the, the, the bonds. I think the other thing I would say is that it's absolutely crucial that this, this approach is led from the top. You have to have yes. your very senior executives having this approach because it's not enough to do it from middle management down or from the staff level up. It's got to be, like any approach, it's got to be led by the leaders. Um, and having, 
you know, even if you were to have somebody at a very senior level saying, actually, you know, during lockdown, this is what I felt. I found I was getting tired by meetings. I found that I couldn't concentrate as much. I found that I wasn't sleeping so well. If they're able to be open and honest and transparent uh-huh. enough about their own reaction, it actually gives permission for other people to do that. Yes, yes. You know, Whereas if you have that, oh, it's no problem at all and I'm desperate to get back into work and I'm going to go back to my 70-hour weeks and all that sort of nonsense, that doesn't help. That actually just makes people feel even more incompetent. Yes, I think that's right. I think, and again, I think the leaders are exhausted as well. I think they have been on the front line of this so far, so I think there needs to be a bit of an acknowledgement of that too. Um, I don't, I don't quite know how how that is addressed, but I think probably everybody's feeling like they need a bit of a holiday. Well, you know what we I had this and again had a similar conversation with an organisation I work with, and they were saying, you know, we can't get our staff to take holidays. You know, we're really worried that once we get back up and we get into full, you know, full work working again, whether it's in the autumn or whatever, that people will have annual leave that they've reserved. And I said, so have you taken annual leave? And they went, no. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, if you can't model that ability to look after yourself. Um, so a lot of the leaders have got to actually walk and, the walk. And, you know, They've got the absolutely they've got to. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, the number of people that you see at very, very senior level who think that, um, it may, means that a good leader that they're sending emails at two, three in the morning or a Sunday morning or whatever. And, you know, all that gives a message to the workforce is, gosh, if I'm going to please this person, I've got to do the same. Now, we can't stop people sending emails at three in the morning, but there's such a thing as an outbox. You know, so you could actually, you could you could work offline and send things when actually it hits half past eight on a Monday morning or whatever your time what, what lines are. You could do that. But I think leaders have to model that. So say, you know what, guys, I'm going off on Friday afternoon. I'm taking the afternoon off and I'm just going to sit in my garden and read a book. Yeah. No. It's by, even if they're not going to, I mean, you don't have to if they're not that, t- that type of person. But they have to say that they are. Uh-huh. And if they want to go off, yeah, hundred percent. I just was going to say I one hundred percent agree with that. I think they've got to model the behaviour, and I think what needs to happen is I think that they need to set out clear commitments or principles that that this new way of working um, embodies, because it is new for everybody, and there will be people who will be working out of the office for a long period of time, and it's this danger of blurring the lines between personal life and work life and I think they need to be you know people need to feel that they have the permission to say actually I'm going to take this afternoon off or I'm going to take two hours for my lunch break today because well I've been working so many hours it's but it's not even about the hours, it's about just managing that sort of mental state between work and home and that separation. Do you mm-hmm. do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely do. And I, I think I think it, it really does come down to. And I think it's also about it's about modelling, but it's also about introducing systems into your workforce, so into your workplace rather. So. Um, Another organisation, because we work with a lot with with psychological trauma, we have a set. We've got we've got in the in the communal cafe areas, we have signs up saying "Give everyone a break, no trauma, no work talk between half past twelve and half past two. So people are actually because more often than not, what happens is somebody will sidle up to you while you're having a sandwich and say, "Look, would you can I just ask you about such and such?" And we're giving permission for people to have. They're not taking a two-hour lunch break, but what we're saying is, during that two hours, there's an expectation that people should be allowed to have time when they're not thinking about work. We've also provided things like. Um, jigsaw puzzles um, mindfulness coloring books many people might have had enough of jigsaw puzzles to them a lifetime with this recent time um mindfulness coloring magazines up to date magazines actually putting stuff around because more often in, in, in some um, businesses what you see is people have business magazines around i don't know if you've noticed that yeah that actually they they're they'll say um they'll have you know um i don't know forbes or whatever sitting around and actually that just puts pressure on people whereas you've got a copy of you know I don't know cars or golf 
or women in home, whatever these magazines are, that kind of gives the message, actually, we know you have a life outside work and we want you to, to remember that you are a person out with this work environment. Yes, absolutely. One of the other things that I've noticed, Dan, is um, in terms of behaviours in the current situation, we seem to have a bit of reverting to type. I don't know if that's down to just higher levels of anxiety or is there something else going on there? Is it people feeling under pressure because they don't feel in control of the situation? I'd be interested to get your view on that. Well, I, I can really only talk from my experience of being, uh, you know, and working in mental health settings as a psychologist, you know, spend a long, long, long time trained to be a clinical psychologist. And that therefore becomes almost part of your DNA. And it must be for the same for people who've yep. got other professional backgrounds. It becomes part of your DNA. And over a over period of time, you learn to sort of rub some of the edges off so that you can work to with other people on a team. If you then work on your own, you become more like you know your original structure if you like i become more like a clinical psychologist than as a member of a team if then what you do is you look for support from people from similar backgrounds so if i start talking more to other clinical psychologists i revert even more to that dna type that kind of core type um, and it makes it harder to come back in and i think that's partly to do with the isolation it's partly to do with what we're comfortable with yeah because, you know, a lot of people will have been back. It's been quite interesting, actually, what even watching people making cakes. You know, there's something about making a cake that's quite comforting. It takes you back to childhood. That's where you first started cooking for lots of us. So there's something about going back to things that feel familiar and feel comfortable at times of general stress. So coming out of that, we have to, first of all, acknowledge that we may well have, re have, have reverted to type. We may have become more of what we were at the start rather than a member of a team and actually actively look at what we probably looking back at what we how we behave now what we wouldn't have done before so um i can't think of an example um for example i mean again i can only talk from my professional point of view but you know clinical psychologists love to use jargon absolutely love to use jargon we never use two syllables well 14 will do i mean it's just ridiculous so and, and i've become quite aware that i've i've been reading more i've been speaking to other psychologists and therefore i've got to be careful not to talk in psych terms yeah. but to, to 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 go back to talking in plain english it'll be the same for lawyers it'll be the same for engineers it'll be the same for people who are in computer industries and construction that actually you will use a language that you were taught as part of your particular specialism and you might have started doing more of that than is helpful and you might also be in danger of thinking well actually if it weren't for me and this team actually we'd be doing nothing because without an engineer in the center of your team then you've got nothing so that sense of actually forgetting that we're part of a system i always think a, a healthy functioning organization is a bit like a healthy functioning human body yeah you can't take out the lungs or the heart or the brain no part is more important than mm -hmm. the rest they all have a different role to fulfill and i think it's just about reminding ourselves of that yes Yes, agreed. Absolutely. I think this is just such a unique situation. And I think um, from my perspective, companies are struggling a bit to know the best way to move forward now because we're starting to come out of lockdown. We need to get back to some semblance of normality. How, how do we do this? while also taking into consideration the psychological challenges and the, the anxiety that our teams are suffering from. It would be really good mm -hmm. to get your perspective on that because, you know, we will be changing policies, things will be changing, it will be a very, very different workplace when everybody gets back in. Yeah, and human beings, we don't like change. We hate change. <laughs> we resist it. And we also do it by sort of rituals you know for example if somebody gets married a change in their status we have the whole wedding or a baby's born or 
you know, there's, there are rituals around lots of our, our, our important things in life. So I'm not suggesting that we have some kind of go back to work COVID party, but, <laughs> but there should be some kind of acknowledgement that this is a new phase yeah. and, and of marking it in some way. I think as well, it's okay to say we're trying this out. My experience of introducing new things to organisations is to say, right, let's pilot this for six months. People like a pilot because you're not committing long term. Yes. And by the time you've got into six months into the pilot, they've forgotten what it was like before. Yeah. So it's actually, it's a really good way. So to say, look, we're going to try this out. We're going to, and we're going to ask for feedback from you guys. So we're going to try, you know, the various things that there are around workforces of practicalities around entrances and exits and hand sanitizer and use of the toilets and cleaning desks. We're going to try that and we're going to get regular feedback as to what feels good and what doesn't. Yes. Because if that, if you empower your workforce by saying, we want to ask for your, you know, your feedback, then that's, that's going to be quite a good way of, of uh, in my opinion, I don't know if you would agree. I think that's an, that's an, ex, that's an excellent idea. I think um, a loop of feedback on a constant basis, doing that regularly. So before you implement something new, um, you go out to your teams and ask, this is what we're proposing, what do you think? Or once it's been in place for a couple of weeks, this has been in place, how's it working? anything we need to change. So yes, I totally agree. I think a constant dialogue with with um, teams is really, really important and will be really helpful. I wonder, Stella, have you found my perception, and you've got much more experience of industry than I have, my perception is that sometimes at a senior level, it's seen as a waste of time. It's seen as, you know, this is a bit indulgent, you know, we, we're paying people, they've just got to do the job. Has that been your experience? I think in normal circumstances, Anne, I would agree with you, yes. I think they think it's a, a nice thing to do, but it's a bit of a tick in the box. And actually, as you say, they just need to get on and do it. But I do genuinely believe in these circumstances that, that leaders are open to to learn and they're keen to do the right thing at the moment. I think not just because they do care about their, their staff, but also because they want to get it right so that they can progress and their business can pick up again. So mm -hmm. I think they really understand that they need to get their teams on board and they need to find the best way of doing that. I think that's a really good message, actually, Stella, because I think I think that gives the message that if you want to do well and survive as a company, you have to do this. Um, and that you know, it's always struck me that you know, in in I, I know that HR and occupational psychology and so on spend a lot of time with businesses because you have to understand that if you have a factory and you don't understand how your machines work, you don't have an effective factory. If you have a business, you don't understand how your, your people work, Absolutely. then you, you're not going to have an effective business. So I think it's really good to hear. And I suspect in the concerns about longevity as we come out as all these anxieties about businesses folding, I suspect if people could be helped to see that if they implement these kind of you know, people friendly policies actually might have a better chance of surviving. Exactly. Than if they revert to the, if they as an organization revert to type and just say, well, I'm sorry, you're being paid to do a job to so just get in and do it. And I don't care if you're upset or anxious or, or feel alienated. No, I totally agree with you. And I do actually think that out of this can come something positive. And I think, um, you know, organizations, leaders can begin to understand that, you know, teams' mental and physical health is something that really does need to be taken into the mix. And it, I am hopeful that there might be a more, now I'm struggling for the word, caring environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would I would totally agree. And I'm, I'm, I'm also very optimistic about this. It's quite interesting when I first started looking at the impact of COVID. Um, I really had prepared it for an organisation that's already on board with a lot of the mental health awareness and a lot of the sort of compassionate approaches. But I shared it around lots of friends. And what's been really, really heartening is the number of businesses. I mean, international business as well that said, this is really good. We want to know more about mm -hmm. it. So I think we've probably we've got the potential to come out of this COVID crisis with a much, much better 
way of understanding how we all tick in crisis and out of it. Yes. Um, so I, I would agree. I think I've been very, very heartened by the enthusiasm with, with which people have, 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 have greeted the stuff that I've written and the conversations that you and I have had. I think it's been very positive. Absolutely. And I do think from having speaking, spoken to leaders recently that they themselves are feeling a level of anxiety that they perhaps haven't before. So I think they're much more open to understanding more about that. And that is why I think these conversations are really useful and having input from psychologists like yourself is really, really helpful and I think will help organisations going forward. I think it really has brought this to the fore. And like I say, I'm hopeful that um, we will maybe see a better workplace at the end of this. So I think that's fantastic, Anne, and, and really appreciate your input. It's fascinating. Thank you. Well, I've really enjoyed it, Stella. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much for speaking to me.